Hey guys, welcome back to Bambi TV. Guys, we're going to be reacting to Jordan Peterson educate young students and leave Oxford Union speechless. Guys, let's go straight into this. So, as you were talking about hierarchy and the relationship that conservatives and liberals have towards it, I was wondering whether that formulation is also a kind of attack on individual sovereignty and a kind of tribalism of saying, here are these two groups of people and here is how they relate to hierarchy and here are their characteristics. Well, it would be if I was trying to reduce all the individual variability to that. But to, to note that people vary across a dimension is not necessarily simultaneously to limit all the variability to those dimensions. There's lots of other variability. And I, your question, to some degree, is whether the act of categorization is in itself a limitation on individual freedom, I think, if you push your question all the way down to the bottom. And the answer to that is, to some degree, yes, but it's also a precondition for individual freedom. So, is that sufficient? But, but you sort of do have certain predispositions that you're giving in the same way in which people from political correctness are trying to say, this is what it means to be a woman, these are the kind of things that it is expected from a woman to do to defend herself. And it seems to me that you are making a similar claim about, this is what conservative people do, and this is how they always relate to power. Well, I don't, I, I would say that I perhaps am doing that, but I don't see how that's the same as what the postmodernists are doing. I mean, as far as I can tell, the postmodernists aren't saying that the groups, the individuals within those groups are characterized by any stable characteristics whatsoever, except for the fact of their comparative oppression. Like, so I don't understand the first part of your argument. I mean, part of the reason the postmodern types have been going after me is because I, I've dared to say that men and women differ in temperament, which, by the way, they do. So, now, you know, that, that's, actually, that, that's actually something that might be worth just di differentiating quickly, because it's actually technically somewhat challenging, but also very much worth knowing. I was debating... Um, someone on a panel this morning on a TV show, the right f stuff. Um, and this was a woman who led the female, the, the Women's Equality Party. And she cited some psychological literature that purported to claim that men and women were mostly the same. And that's actually true. We are more the same than different. If you look at our temperaments, there's more overlap than there is variance by a substantial amount. And so even, on the temperamental dimensions where there is most difference between men and women, the difference isn't of massive magnitude at the center of the distribution. So for example, women are less aggressive than men, which is, by the way, why they commit suicide, try to commit suicide more often, but are much less lethal in their actions. That's one example, but there are many examples. If you draw a random woman and a random man out of the population, the probability that the man will be more aggressive is 60%. If you bet on the man, you'd win 60% of the time. That's not a walloping difference. It's not 95% of the time. You yeah. know, it's, it's a difference that is substantive. It's significant. It's measurable. But it's not large by the standards by which such things are judged. But that's not the point. The point is, is that most of the activity takes place at the extremes. So out on the tails of the distribution. So here's an example. About 9 out of 10 people in prison are male. Why? Because to be in prison, you have to be the most aggressive person, let's say, in 100. Okay. Those differences at the midpoint are large enough so that if you go out to the extremes, 1 in 100 people, you have an overwhelming preponderance of men. And so you can have your cake and eat it too. You can say, well, yeah, broadly speaking, men and women are more the same than different. The, o the overlap is greater than the, than, the, than the disjunction. But that's not relevant if what's being selected is often at the extremes, and it often is. So for example, with regards to engineering, there's a fair bit of evidence that people who are more interested in things than in people become engineers. Now, that's not really gonna be, what is that, shocking? Are you shocked by that? You shouldn't be shocked by that, right? You can, you can tell that not only by what engineers do, but you can tell that by how they think, and you can tell that just by talking to them, if you know a bunch of engineers. So, and it turns out that the largest temperamental difference that's known between men and women is actually interest in people versus interest in things. 
And so it has nothing to do with competence, but it has a lot to do with interest. And because you have to be very interested in things to go be an engineer, because that's all you're going to be doing if you're an engineer, then only those people who are extremely interested in things tend to become engineers. And most of them are men. And that's why even in places like Scandinavia, where a tremendous amount of effort has been put into flattening the socio-cultural landscape, and successfully, by the way, there's still a preponderance of male engineers. And there's a preponderance of female nurses. And no matter how much sociological gerrymandering goes, along, goes on, those statistics mm. have remained quite intractable over about a 15-year period. And so, there are differences. There are differences. They're not massive. And then you might ask, well, are those sociocultural or biological? It's like, well, that's a hard question to answer because it depends on how much variability there is in this sociocultural landscape because the proportion by which something is biological versus sociocultural varies with the sociocultural landscape. That's a complicated thing to, to, to digest because you think of those things as fixed, but they're not. So, but what we have demonstrated quite clearly and this is mainstream science, despite the fact that people don't like it. This test has already been done. So we, we developed a personality model that's pretty stable across cultures, purely derived from statistical, from statistical processes, an atheoretical model, if there ever was one, and quite an unattractive model because of that, conceptually. But that's beside the point. Then we saw, cross-culturally, whether there were differences in the fundamental temperaments of men and women. And the answer was yes, cross-culturally, quite robust. Women are higher in the experience of anxiety and emotional pain, and they're more compassionate and agreeable. Those are the big differences. And they're, they're differences of a magnitude that I already pointed out. Then the next question is, well, to what degree is that biological versus sociocultural? And it's complicated because that vari variable depends on the sociocultural landscape, but we'll put that aside. You can determine that by stacking up countries from those who have done everything they possibly can to flatten out the socio-cultural landscape in relationship to gender to those who haven't, that are still very stratified by, by sex. And then what you do is you look at the magnitude of the temperament differences in keeping with the, the variability that those countries have in terms of their socio-cultural egalitarianism. And the socio-cultural types, the, the, um, the social constructionists, their prediction is, as cultures become more egalitarian, Men and women become more different, more the same, sorry, more the same, because it's environmental. That isn't what happens. Exactly the opposite happens. As you flatten out the socio-cultural landscape, men and women become more different. The data is in, the experiment is done. Tens of thousands of people, multiple countries. And it's not what anyone expected. And you might think, well, it's all the right-wing psychologists. It's like. All the right-wing psychologists are in this room, sitting in this chair. <laughs> Guys, this was amazing. Like, I actually love the way Joel Peterson... I actually love the way Joel Peterson expresses himself. Like, if you know Joel Peterson, you know he's actually in for those gender equality and stuff. He's actually a feminist, I would say. If feminists stand for what I think it's not believing that women should end, um, women should be treated equally as men. Yes, I believe they should. And I believe no one will actually, no logical person will feel women should be treated less than a man. It's, they will be treated the same. Like, yes, that part is, uh, but like, I feel that is someone that actually advocates for things like this. People are actually trying to belittle men or make, make men feel like you shouldn't be like this. You can act like this. But I feel he's someone that actually tries to make men feel like you're supposed to work. I feel he and Tate are similar, but Tate is kind of toxic and he's not. Yes, I think that's just the right word. <laughs> but like guys, tell me what you think about this video. Just to like, share, subscribe to my channel. I'll see you next time, guys. Peace.